Well, let's go through what the application process, examination process actually looks like. So I get it, I read it, the specification, that's what you've written, the claims, what you're trying to cover. And the first thing I do is I, I decide, do you have one or more than one invention? We talked about that, it's called the restriction requirement. And if, I, if you do not, and all your claims are directed to one invention, well, I will go and search the prior art databases based on your claims, okay? On the other hand, if you have multiple inventions, that's when we get into the restriction requirement. I prepare it, I send it to you, and I say, you're the experts, you have two inventions here, pick one. They say, okay, I've picked the timepiece, uh, and it comes back to me, now I know which one to go search, not the sponge, the sponge has gone away, and I will search the prior art databases for timepieces. Yes? So the question is, you, you have a restriction requirement and you elect one invention, what happens to that invention? Um, and you get, the, you, you get to keep the date of the filing. So let me answer the second question first. You get to keep the date of the original application that had both inventions in it. The invention that is not elected, a couple of things can happen to it. The first thing is, you can, you can file, you'll file what is known as a divisional application if you want to pursue those claims. Right, because think about it. I have divided your application to, or claims into two sections, the timepiece and the sponge. And you say, I'm interested in both, but I would like you to examine the timepiece first. Okay, so you can file a divisional application on the sponge claims the next day. You know, that's fine. Or you can wait until uh, before the timepiece claims issue and then file the sponge claims, because you might say at that point, I'm just not interested, right? But you get to keep the date of the filing of the patent application that had both sets of claims in it. Okay, and it's called a divisional application, and it would not be a, another provision. So the question was, um, if you had a restriction requirement, how long can you wait before you file a divisional application? The answer is you can wait until the date that the first application issues, right? So typically what happens is this. If you know you want the second invention claims uh, early, you can file a divisional right away. But you, the latest you can is the date that the first application issues. So when it issues as a patent, you, that's it. You cannot, then you, you, lose the, uh, key, you lose the connection to the date. But as long as the application is pending, which is not issued, you get to file a divisional at any point. Okay, so the, it's up to the date of issuance of the elected invention. All right? All right, it's a good question, thank you. Uh, okay, moving on. So, you've um, elected an invention, if, I've, if I forced you to, then I have looked at the scope of your claims, I have then examined the prior art databases, and I prepare a non-final action, right? You cannot get a final action right away. The first action is always non-final because you, as the applicant, have a, should have an opportunity to respond to my objections or rejections. So that's what I would do. I would either I would object, I can object to the claims, the specification, so if there are typographical errors, I could say, fix these. Um, if you're missing a drawing, well, you're usually gonna notice some missing parts, but sometimes they miss that, and I say, or I could say your drawing is unclear. I mean, I don't know what the scribble is, please, I have a formal drawing uh, submitted, or a clear drawing, um, and then I can I'll, uh, reject your claims based on sections of the United States Code that you have already seen in a prior seminar, the patent seminar. So what, what do they sound like? 101, 102, 112, 103. These are sections of the United States Code that permit me, as a patent examiner, to reject your claims. Okay, so my rejections have to fit under one of those sections. I can't just say, I don't like it, right? Which, so I have to give a reason, and it has to fit under one of the legal sections of the United States Code, the laws that I have to, question? Okay. So I would refer you again to a prior seminar in which they do talk about these various sections of the United States Code. And just um, by way of review, they would, essentially I'm looking for, are the claims anticipated? Are they obvious? Have you described enough? That's what the 101, 102, 112 goes into. Okay, so I said you're, you are able to respond to my non-final office action. And 
I will then review your response and I will complete a new prior art search based on what you have done. So what can you do? You can amend the claims. You can argue that, hey, examiner, you just got it wrong. The art that you cited is improper. It says, you say, it says A, it actually says B. Okay, I may have gotten it wrong. And you can present evidence that shows that um, your invention is different from what's already described. All of those are fine. I will review what you have. And I will, I will then make a decision, a legal decision. Are the claims that you have at this point allowable over the prior art that I have cited against you? Okay? Great. If they are, no problem. I'll issue you a notice of allowance. You pay the issue fee. You get your patent. Off you go. What if they're not? That's when I prepare something else, a final rejection. Now, it's final in that it restricts your options because the patent officer's goal is to get through the examination in as ex expeditious a manner as possible. So a final rejection limits your choices because you've already had an option, an opportunity to respond to what I've said. And your limited options after final are you could file an after final response just like you filed a response after a non-final action. You could just say, once again, I'm amending the claims, examiner, you got it wrong, here's some evidence, all right? That's all, all those are possible. Entry of an after-final amendment is at my discretion, whereas entry of a response after a non-final is non-discretionary. I have to enter and consider the response that you had after final, okay? After non-final, I'm sorry. After final, it's up to me. You could appeal. You say, listen, I'm, I'm done with this examiner. He's just terrible, got it all wrong. I want to appeal to a higher authority. It's fine. You could say, the prior art that's cited against me is so strong, meaning my invention has already been described, so I'm not going to get a patent on this. I'm going to abandon the patent application. And most of you might be thinking, that's just a terrible option. But it's actually, I've seen um, a lot of companies and individuals abandon applications because the process is expensive. And you might just say, I'm not going to get, if I get anything at the back end, it'll be very, very narrow. It's not worth it. Perfectly reasonable strategy. And oftentimes what you'll see is filing something called a, a request for continued examination. And what that is, is you telling the patent office, I want to start the process again. Go back to a non-final. I want another round. Right? So, um, and another round gives you, I look, I look at your response, I'll get you typically we'll get a non-final office action again. Yes? So the question was, if somebody abandons an application, um, is it as if this never existed and there's no prior art? It depends on whether the application was published or not. If the application is published, it becomes known to the world and it's part of the prior art. Typically, when you get to this stage, it's been published. But then the question is, but then no one owns it. That's right. So now it is, so the fundamental tenant of, of US patent law, actually patent law in general, is you cannot take out of the public what the public already has. Right? So if the public already knows about something, you cannot take it out of the public. And that is the way the patent uh, system has developed in the United States as a reaction to what happened in the UK, uh, at that time England, um, with these royal patent grants, which is where we got the term from. So yes, if it's published, it becomes part of the, the, our general knowledge of things that we know, and we cannot then take it out. Somebody cannot now carve a uh, fence around that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, comment, and the issue was, um, before you file a patent application, it makes sense to survey the prior art to see what's already out there, and uh, so that you don't waste time. And what are the tools available in addition to, say, Google Patents? Um, Google Patents actually is pretty awesome, uh, because they have taken the data that the patent office has given them and, and done something with it. You, uh, you could also use some of the databases that we use at the patent office. How would you do that? We have public search rooms, right? And, and they're actually professional searchers that know how to do these things. So the companies, for example, will hire professional searchers and say, before we waste our time filing, go use the same tools that an examiner would use. Think like an examiner, essentially. And some of these people are ex-examiners and tell us what the landscape out there looks like, okay? And some of these tools, we call them East, West, and what they are, East is 
uh, examiner application search tool, uh, West is web enabled search tool. So these are some of the terms that you might hear, East, West. Um, and so they're search tools that we at the, uh, within the patent office use, uh, databases. So that you could do that um, as well. Most of the time, I have to say, you are the expert about what is actually out there, right? Because you are in that field. So uh, it is very common that you are the, your best source of what the, the uh, rest of the landscape, patent landscape. It doesn't even have to be patent landscape. What are the intellectual property and publication landscape looks like? So it's typically you. Yes? Yes, sure. The question is, are they available to the general public? The answer is yes. Um, now, I don't know whether they're available uh, online. I think you actually, there are rooms at the patent office where you can, there are computers that you can just go and use there. So, yes, it not required, but it's generally a good idea to spend some time figuring out what else is out there before you spend uh, time filing and prosecuting a patent application, because it is expensive. 